Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As uh, uh, Chris said, that um, I am uh, I teach at uh, University of East London, but uh, thanks to my old friend Jerome Lewis, that um, I'm also now um, a research fellow at UCL as of um, this year. So uh, maybe some of you who are affiliated here might see a little bit more of me. Um, uh, I'm actually um, not going to be talking about uh, Mother Scorpion um, today. I've talked about it, um, it uh, uh, at uh, RAG on other occasions, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the mosquito Mother Scorpion, which is this uh, representation of the mosquito body politic as a, um, a, a, a female scorpion with hundreds of breasts that uh, stings its um, a final uh, prey into submission and consumes it. And that's, uh, if you like, the mosquito representation of the present and the past and the future and the body politic and um, so forth. I'm not going to be talking about that. I, I, I will talk a little bit about the mosquito, but uh, what I want to um, talk to you today about is myth and uh, uh, it, it, to talk about myth. And I want to talk about myth in uh, lowland South and Central America. Um, uh, and. Uh, some of the ideas that I've, I've started uh, kicking around about uh, uh, um, myth, uh, myths, how we should understand uh, myths in lowland South, Ameri South and Central America. Um, and uh, for the t to that end, I'm going to present three myths to you. One of them is from the Tatuyo, who are a people of, uh, on the uh, Brazilian-Colombian border on the Valpeche River, or one of the tributaries of the Valpeche. They're part of the peoples that are known uh, collectively of to, as uh, Tucano. Um, they're very interesting. Uh, I want to talk to you about also the next myth is about the Kuna, who are a people on the, um, the Caribbean coast. If Panama's like an S on its side, and they're on the eastern side, we're on the northern uh, eastern side on the Caribbean coast, and they live on the little islands that string along the Panama Panamanian coast uh, on the Caribbean side, the Kuna people. Um, and I want to give you a, a further myth from a people uh, called the Rama, who are from eastern Nicaragua, and they're um, to the south of the Mosquito. They're found in um, southeast uh, uh, Nicaragua. If I've got time, I'll, I've got another, just a little mythette, if you like, uh, from uh, the Mosquito as well. But um, what I really want to do is uh, look at how um, myth, marriage, and affinity um, are understood and what this tells us about, if you like, uh, uh, social processes and also thinking in um, what I've called um, Greater Amazonia. And greater Amazonia, I mean uh, peoples who are um, described as um, indigenous, so it's, in, it, it's um, if you like, um, so-called indigenous cosmology that I'm interested in. I'm calling this area um, Greater Amazonia, and what I, uh, because it's uh, less of a mouthful than lowland south or central um, uh, America, and um, Greater Amazonia is essentially um, the Amazon Basin and then parts of um, South and Central America that are not in the Amazon uh, Basin um, uh, in geographical terms, but include things like the Guyana Shield or Orinoco Basin, the Darien Gap on um, the South Cent in Panama, um, the Mosquito Coast, and so forth. And these are all um, areas which are... Uh, um, for many, uh, largely, or have in the past, um, have largely been um, uh, rainforest or secondary rainforest in some ca uh, for a lot of it, um, savanna uh, and so forth. And that uh, these areas, um, uh, many anthropologists have noted have noted um, that many of the, if you like, uh, the cultural practices, the forms of social organisation, or if we call them that, um, in that in Greater Amazonia. Um, have commonalities which are, um, are quite interesting. Um, so, for example, many of these peoples in this area seem to share certain kinds of um, subsistence. For example, many of them are uh, involved with um, the cultivation of manioc or cassava. Um, they're often peoples who are um, river peoples who use canoes. Um, they uh, have practice uh, uh, what has been uh, cross-cousin marriage, for example, they've been uh, described as practicing cross-cousin marriage. So they're very different, for example, from uh, peoples in the, um, the Andes or Mesoamerica and so forth. Of course, there are huge differences amongst themselves, but there are also um, some similarities, which I think is, uh, are quite interesting. Um, Levi-Strauss uh, drew in uh, Mythologique, his four-volume uh, um, uh, 
his four volume essay, if you like, on mythology. He drew a lot on um, uh, peoples of greater Amazonia. And um, what I, I want to do is um, to uh, ask you to join me in, if you like, in an exploration of what I think is uh, greater Amazonian thought, if you like. Okay. First of all, um, yeah, uh, those of you who can't see the slides, the slides are not desperately enlightening. They're just, uh, if anything, prompts for me, so you're not really missing anything. So, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, one, one of the things I, uh, um, I, I, I want to talk to you about, the th what I'm really interested in is, if you like, myth and meaning. And I'm quite interested in trying to develop, a, if you like, a, a, a regional understanding of how myth works for Greater Amazonia. And um, because up to now, although there have been some really excellent and very interesting studies of myth, that there haven't been any that have really uh, looked at the region in comparative terms, apart from levi strauss's Mythologique, which isn't necessarily the easiest read um, and isn't really focused on, uh, if you like, a regional comparative um, uh, analysis. So first of all, I wanted just to have a little qu quick um, trot. I mean, I think most of you are anthropology students, and RAG isn't necessarily always um, mainly anthropology students, so I think I'll probably be telling quite a lot of you what you know already about um, how anthropologists have treated myths. So, um, for example, for some anthropologists in the um, days in the early uh, uh, 20th century, the myth uh, was thought of uh, very much in functionalist terms as, in some sense, uh, a validation of, or, as, of um, social structure or social processes, as Malinowski called it, a, a social charter. So, for example, we could understand um, uh, myths amongst Trobriand Islanders, which were a, a matrilineal, the Trobriand were described as a matrilineal uh, society by um, Malinowski, that myth was really that the unit of social reproduction was the brother and sister uh, within the sub-clan and, of course, that uh, women were impregnated not by um, uh, men, but what men did was they'd have sexual intercourse with women and open up the women so that the woman's own sub-clan uh, spirit uh, um, could enter her and impregnate her. Um, and, of course, uh, it was really the brother um, who uh, uh, was, if you like, um, the important person in a child's um, life, the mother's brother rather, and that the, uh, the person who we would think of as the father was really just like an affine, so to speak. So this is something which is uh, quite interesting. And so it's not surprising that the myth of origin of Trobrand subclans tends to be um, a brother and sister emerging from a cave or a hole in the ground kind of thing. So myths of that kind would validate, uh, if you like, her Trobrand um, matrilineal descent. Um, so this is um, the kind of thing we find in the work of um, Malinowski and also Radcliffe Brown in the Andaman Islands. And but before that, and often isn't so well known um, or so well taught, is that Rivers was in fact actually taught a, a, a great deal about myth, as wrote about myth as well. You also um, have accounts of myth that look at um, uh, how myth legitimates uh, relations of authority of pa and power. And so we have things like, of uh, course. Uh, uh, Morris Bloch's work has done some of that, but also, um, if you like, people like um, Bamberger, whose famous um, uh, paper Myths and uh, Matriarchy has been um, you know, well discussed by, uh, I think, people who have presented here. Um, um, now, in thinking about myth and um, structure, that this is, uh, if you like, I'm talking about the structure of the mind. I'm talking about another approach, uh, um, important approach to the study of myth, which is, uh, if you like, um, structuralist kinds and formalist accounts of myth. And of course, one of the most influential in that respect was Vladimir Propp's uh, morphology of the folktale. And what uh, Propp did, even before Levi Strauss, and he influenced Levi Strauss, was that Propp had the idea in looking at Russian folktales that in order to understand um, Russian folk tales, what you had to do was take a uh, look at the myths, uh, all these folk tales, and divide them up into the smallest meaningful chunks in the way that I know you've seen uh, Chris and Camilla do in some of the workshops that you've had, that myths are divided up into meaningful chunks 
which are then, com and then when we compare them against other similar myths or different uh, variations of the same myth, that you can look at um, where those many meaningful, uh, where myths are almost the same but a little bit different, perhaps from different regions, or myths that mean something not quite the same or even mean the opposite, but one a variable is turned round that one can compare those myths and if you sense put in a sense put them together and look at them as if you like transformations of the same myth and it was prop who really did that i guess first vladimir prop in 1928 and of course this has um, influenced uh, levi strauss in Myth mythologique who uh, used this kind of style of analysis of dividing myths up into comp into the smallest parts and looking at how different myths all were, if you like, transformations of one another. And this is, if you like, the subject of uh, mythologique. And of course, what Levi-Strauss is interested in is what this can tell us about, if you like, uh, um, the, uh, about human thought, about the logic of thought. So not just about the contents of myths, but also, if you like, the syntax of myths and the syntax of thought. So this is what uh, Levi-Strauss's uh, approach to myth is. And um, that he uses a lot of the myths from Greater Amazonia to, um, as well as some other places, but uh, a, a, a huge percentage of them are from uh, Greater Amazonia, which he uses to, uh, it, to make sense of that kind of idea. Now, um, if we come to a myth in uh, Greater Amazonia, um, that uh, it's very different, uh, I think, from myth in the old world, in old world societies. The old world um, uh, cultures, that myths are very much focused on, if you like, uh, parents and children um, relationships. So you have the myth of the Holy Family, the Oedipal myth for, um, you know, the incest taboo, for example, which is about, um, you know, the mother and um, child, uh, the uh, Abrahamic myths of, you know, killing the child, his children and so forth. So myths are very, and, and we see this not just in, of course, uh, classical mythology or biblical accounts, but also within anthropology, like with Fortes's uh, Oedipus and Job in West Africa is a classic account of that. So you, you're looking at myths are very much focused, if you like, on um, uh, uh, filial relations, so to speak. Well, in um, Greater Amazonia, um, that myths are very, very different and they're focused crucially on affinal relations. It's relations of affinity which are really important. And for those of you who are not anthropologists, affinal relations means relations with one's in-laws. Affines is not exactly the same, but affines is just anthropological terminology for one's in-laws. So the myths are focused on uh, things like the brother-in-law relationship, on uh, mother-in-law, son-in-law. Um, it's in-law relationships that are problematic because in Greater Amazonia, as um, those of you who might have uh, looked at some of the Greater Amazonian material, is that it's um, a final relationships which are almost uh, like a cultural obsession. That um, it's, I can't remember who it was that joked if uh, Americans are really fixated on um, death and taxes, as uh, I think, I can't remember who it was who said it, that in Amazonia that they're fixated on um, death and your in-laws. That's <laughs> what really what it is. A friend of mine who's a, a very a good Amer anthropologist and Mediterranean, Ma um, Mario Saris, um, always jokes with me, he made a joke to me ages ago, which I've taken with me, he said that um, if in the Mediterranean people see strange things, something that's strange, they throw stones at it. In uh, um, uh, the Amazonia, what they do is you try and exchange your sister with it, sort of thing. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, you know, how you construct uh, society and sociality. You need the uh, final other to reproduce society. You need affines to do that. The problem is that um, affines are, um, is, are dangerous. You don't know really what they're like necessarily. They're the dangerous other and that you have to, in some sense, domesticate that dangerous other somehow. You have to domesticate the dangerous other. This is what um, uh, 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 um, concerns people in um, lowland South and Central American um, societies of the kinds that I've mentioned. Um, so uh, some of the, uh, f the features um, that f might give you a little bit more background into um, Amazonia is um, uh, uh, 
as well is that the styles of kinship that uh, are how marriage, because marriage is the way for which relations with others are, um, uh, if you like, uh, constituted and they're dangerous. It's not really, marriages tend not in most cases, of course I'm making generalizations here, but generally speaking it's not through institutions like uh, bride wealth, and a bride wealth is really a, tra a, 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 a a, um, a, a, a prestation or a gift from one group to, or series of group gifts from one group to another which legitimate a marriage from, from bride wealth is from the, uh, the wife takers to the wife givers and then you get rights over um, the labour of the woman who will typically come across to their side, rights over her sexuality, her uh, procreative powers and all of those kind of things. So it's maybe in the context of a ritual that the, the bride wealth is paid or whatever, putting it very simplistically, one day you're not married and then the next day you are married after this ritual. Bride service doesn't work like that and then of course in societies where, uh, where prestige is kind of quite important and where you have, if you like, ranking, it's often things like dowry that legitimate marriages where uh, the, the gifts come with the bride, often as a kind of pre-mortem inheritance and will go to um, the wife takers and the wife takers, for example, in places like uh, North India will be regarded as superior to the wife givers and so forth. So dowry encodes relations of prestige. Well, in Greater Amazonia, that marriages are organised around bride service. Now, bride service is very different to bride wealth or dowry insofar as um, it involves um, the groom, not any of his kin, but the groom, trying to get into the goodwill and the good graces of his in-laws. So becoming uh, married uh, in uh, many instances in Amazonia is a process not a sudden, sudden change of state, it's a gradual process. Um, so bride service is um, the way in which marriage is enacted in many of the societies uh, or the cultures I'm talking about. Historically, you've also had um, uh, spouse capture. So this is, um, you've had uh, bride capture, um, for example, amongst the uh, uh, Tucano, of which the Tatuyu I'm going to speak are an example, where um, historically uh, groups of men have gone on raids and captured women. We've one knows about this from probably many of you from the Yanomami um, ethnography that you, I guess, many of you've been taught. Um, but it's not always the case. I mean, the Kuna would practice. Um, uh, uh, groom capture uh, and in a more attenuated way also the mosquito. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, and also uh, amongst um, in um, uh, many p cultures or many peoples in lowland Amazonia that the ideal form of marriage because in some sense it uh, diffuses that asymmetry and tension between wife givers and wife takers as this is understood, or perhaps more strictly speaking, spouse givers and spouse takers, if we're talking about husband givers and husband takers, that if you have um, spouse ex exchange, which is often described as sister exchange, that that represents a harmonious, um, aesthetically, particularly aesthetically pleasing, um, uh, if you like, uh, resolution of the problem of affinity, that if you can both sym symmetrically exchange uh, um, uh, of your brothers or exchange your sisters, then that, if you like, uh, diffuses the problem of affinity because it's, as I said, it's the final relations which are so dangerous. Now, how do uh, people in Greater Amazonia actually deal with affinity? And what's interesting is, I think, that in Greater Amazonia, what's interesting is that you see a lot of the same themes and um, uh, uh, um, obsessions appearing again, but it's as you move around the sort of region, it's sort of like a bit like a kaleidoscope when you're reading the ethnographies in that it's the same kind of things that are there, but as you twist it round, the elements can get shifted about a bit. So of course, um, if I, maybe if I go through examples of how um, the domestic other is, uh, the um, sorry, the dangerous other is domesticated, um, with the Yanomami historically in descriptions of the Yanomami. Now, we know, that it, even from uh, Shagnon's work, that this isn't always necessarily empirically true, but the representation of the Yanomami is through a bride capture. So this is uh, one style of which, uh, in other words, what you do with your affines, you don't really bother them, you just go and grab their women. This is the sort of Yana representation of the Yanomami. Then you've got, for example, in central Brazil, where you have the Bororo, Cayapo, Chivante, uh, Canela as pictured there. These are communities where your affines are within the same village, but all the village lives in a kind of circle. And, um, for example, amongst the Canela, that, um, uh, that 
uh, sisters uh, with their houses are all at different kind of parts of the um, village wheel. The village is like a big circle and the men tend to live in a sort of men's house in the middle sort of thing. And if you like, the uh, men move across the circle from uh, one where they've been raised from their mothers to the other side of the circle. So if you like, affines are uh, domesticated through being brought across the circle, if you like, I I in some sense. Then you've got um, Western Amazonia, places like um, the Arawate and the Wari and so forth. And that's very interesting if you look at the Wari and uh, the Arawate, um, the representation that the other is in some way domesticated through rituals of various kinds. So for example, amongst the Wari of, in the Western Amazonia, that the, um, the affines do certain kinds of jobs for, for that people do certain kind of jobs for their affines, and in that way, um, if you like, uh, generate relationships with their affines, cordial relations. So, amongst the Wari, that historically, that when somebody has died, one of your affine, when somebody dies, it's the job of the affines to eat the body and therefore prepare it for the soul uh, to go into the other. So, it's like ritualized cannibalism, and if you like, some representations of that that are found in Arawate um, cosmology is described by, famously by Viveros de Castro. Are they eating or Literally uh, for the Wari, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, for the Arawate we, we just have it uh, metaphorically, but for the Wari um, it's, uh, there seems kind of quite strong evidence that it's been uh, literally and uh, um, uh, um, uh, that Conklin, who did field work with them, that she reported that um, you know many elders would tell her quite frankly, quite as a matter of factly, that that's what they used to do up until um, the late 50s or early 60s when uh, Christian has introduced this horrible practice, really not very nice practice, of making you put your affines under the ground. It was much more, and they talk about it as compassion, that you would compassionately eat them and prepare their souls for the other world. So yeah, we have to take a moral relativism on that one, I think. Um, so that's how affines are actually dealt with within that area. And then this is the Hivaro through, again, through the uh, affines are kept at a distance and it's uh, uh, one's enemies. In Lower Central America with the mosquito Kuna Rama, it's through groom capture. So historically you've had groups of women and I've, this is what I've written about in my, some of my own work is where groups of women have, uh, if you like, um, it, um, ensnare young men, um, so it's all a really about groom capture, and this is actually in the past that young men from one group would go and actually capture men from another group uh, uh, or another part of the village because they tended to be, um, marriage was endogamous, it tended to be within the village, they'd capture men and then for four days in a row they'd throw them into their sister's hammock sort of thing until they sort of gave up and so <laughs> forth. And So this was groom capture. So um, then you've got the interesting case of the Guyanas, um, where place, which is, includes Venezuela as well, but it's sort of the Guyana shield basically, where um, the other is domesticated by being reinvented as consanguinal kin. And they use uh, many people like the Piaroa and the Pimon, that they use the same terms uh, for um, affines as they were for consanguinal kin. And the practice very close uh, cross cousin marriage is very kind of common. So kin, the, the, the notion of thinking that you've got people who you're affines, your in-laws, is too awful to contemplate. So what do you do? You just say, oh, in fact, you're brothers and sisters. It's, that's not a problem sort of thing. So you reinvent them as kin. And then the Northwest Amazon, which is um, the Tatuyu, who's the first myth I'm going to talk about, uh, included in, in this group. Um, the Northwest Amazon in the Valpesh area, that you have um, uh, these are areas where communities are generally uh, live along rivers. They're single longhouse communities where you have uh, generally perhaps a father and um, several sons with wives. And the, the, the exogamous marriage, insofar as women come from other longhouse communities, but other than the very large group, the Cubeo, that all of these groups um, practice, uh, all, you have a number of different languages, you've got like 15 or 16 languages in a small area, and each longhouse has one a, lang a language that's associated uh, with that particular longhouse, so you've got 16 or so different languages. People are often multilingual, but they have, they're very proud of their emblem language, but they practice linguistic exogamy in that if a woman comes is married into one of those groups, in the past often through um, raiding, but not now necessarily, perhaps symbolic thing, that it'd have to be someone whose um, longhouse uh, had a different language uh, as an emblem. So you had linguistic exogamy, so language in a sense marked difference and affinity 
And um, Gene Jackson, who's written the book The Fish People about this, uh, uh, this particular um, uh, 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 situation, that she, she was asked her things because all of those people in the in the area said had uh, Tucano as their um, lingua franca. So, because there's said say 16 languages or so spoken only amongst about 7,000 people or something like that, that um, Jean Jackson said, well, in that case, why don't you just give up all these other languages and just speak Tucano with one another? And she, they said, well, who would we marry then, sort of thing. <laughs> so. In-laws are kept at a distance through, on the one hand, marriage, and on the other hand, through coming from other longhouse communities. So these are a number of different ways um, through which uh, 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 people in uh, greater Amazonia, uh, if you like, um, manage the problem of affinity. You see a number of different ways. But amongst all of these peoples, the, the question of having to, how do you deal with your affines, is something which is, you know, is something which is... It, really important, it's absolutely central. Um, one of the things to think about when we're talking about uh, myths in Amazonia is um, that you have to think uh, 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 that myths, in a sense, that you, you're entering a kind of, if you like, a realm of thought that in many ways is uh, quite different to the kind of Western thought. Uh, uh, Western thought. And so, for example, in the West, um, we tend to think of um, human beings of having, uh, uh, at some point in time, emerged from, uh, you know, from animals. We've uh, evolved from animals. Well, in Amazonia, that's uh, not necessarily the case that um, all animals at one time were like humans. Um, and so when we're just talk, giving you talking about these myths and when uh, people like uh, Makor had a fight with um, Adam, which is in the Rama myth, that you have to think that the Makors at one time was a human being sort of thing. And you also, the other thing is to think about uh, is that animals and supernaturals in Amazonia, um, and this is Levi, uh, sorry, uh, Viveros de Castro's uh, big idea of uh, multinaturalism or perspectivalism, as he's called it, is that um, supernaturals, animals, um, and um, other groups of people, other than your own group of people, that they all, um, if you like, have um, different. Um, uh, natures. We think of um, the uh, the living world as being one uh, where we all share the same nature. That you know that somehow all the DNA is all there shared between us and plants and all the little mites and the birdies and the bees and everything that we're all part of the same nature. And but that things like um, ants and um, other peoples and. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, jaguars and other things have, uh, if you like, different cultures in the sense that they do things in different kind of ways. Well, in Amazonia, this is in Greater Amazonia, according to Vives, Viveros de Castro, whose big idea on this is gaining quite a lot of traction, that it's not like that at all, that what happens is that, uh, that people, um, that animals, um, sorry, that um, he says in Greater Amazonia that uh, that um, people are, the th that thought is essentially ethnocentric in the sense that animals and spirits and other kinds of peoples and supernaturals of all different kinds have the same kind of culture as us. Yeah, they, but they live in different natures. So when you look at uh, 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 things like uh, pigs. Say, or, well, let's say jaguars, and you see that jaguar has killed a peccary and is um, drinking its blood. That's exactly the same as us drinking manioc beer, except we see it differently because we have a different perspective and because we occupy a different nature, um, that that's uh, very different, uh, uh, that we see it in a particular way. So that we see things differently to um, other peoples and supernaturals and animals because um, we have a different nature to them. But basically, um, they have the same culture as us, insofar as jaguars, um, if you like, drink uh, what they think is manioc beer. They marry their cross cousins, they practice bride service, they have shamans. They do all those things that we do, um, but um, they see, we see it differently because of that. So when shamans dress up and things like that, and they put on jaguar feathers and everything, it's not imitation or expressive or anything. What they're doing is, is like this equivalent of putting on a spacesuit or a diving um, suit to go into this other kind of nature. And this is what shamans are very good at, that they can go into other natures and, if you like, deal with problems that emanate from those different natures, whether it's sh other shamans from other peoples or uh, guardian spirit owners from different kind of animals and so forth, that this is um, where they're kind of at. So 
in thinking about these myths, um, you might kind of hold that kind of idea in the uh, back of your mind. Right, um, now, um, in thinking about uh, affinity, I've got uh, a myth uh, from uh, the Tatuyo. And the Tatuyo are one of these people who practice linguistic exogamy, that uh, Tatuyo communities are in uh, longhouse communities, but they're almost always one longhouse with um, uh, patrilineal descent where women marry into from different uh, women who have a different linguistic emblem and so forth. And this is a myth which was collected by Patrice uh, Bido, who wrote a wonderful article called On Death, Incest and Death. So uh, just as I was saying of death and taxes, it's uh, death and uh, affinity that uh, Patrick uh, uh, Bido acknowledges that. And he's, what he's talking about is um, the story of um, uh, incest and the prohibition of incest and how that comes about. And the prohibition of incest is really, uh, if you like, the beginning of affinity, as Levi-Strauss argued. It's that, that when, what for Levi-Strauss uh, af um, affinity is about having to marry out, having to marry others, is uh, what that means is about establishing relations for others. And in greater Amazonia, as in other parts of the world, that you need to do that to um, establish relations with um, other groups. So um, incest in Greater Amazonia is not something that's necessarily thought of as uh, uh, morally wrong, although it often is, I guess, um, but what it is, it's socially absurd. It's because, and people will often say to you, um, for example, um, they said to me before I was married that when I did field work, um, you'd go to the field and um, people would say, uh, are you married? You know, this is an anthropologist all over Greater Amazonia find this, and you say, well, no, I'm not. And instead of saying, um, do, why don't you want a wife? They'll often say, why don't you want a brother-in-law sort of thing? You know, this is something. And this is Amazonian, Greater Amazonian, certainly mosquito humor is all um, surround, about um, confronting the idea of a joke is to confront someone with the idea that they are um, an affine with someone else, that that's terribly funny. So, I mean, remember Pete Gao, who's an anthropologist who works with the Piro um, in um, Peru, that, that well, he took some time off to um, take some tourists around some part of Amazonia or something like that, and they stopped at some um, community somewhere or other, and uh, the person, uh, and the, uh, one of the tourists, a European tourist, said, uh, uh, could you ask him what that plant is, sort of thing. So Pete said to him, um, in Spanish, well, what's that plant? And he said, it's the Balsa Woods brother-in-law. And of course, him and Pete, because Pete was experienced over land, they burst into laughter because they could see that that was a, a typical Amazonian kind of joke. And the tourist asked him to explain it. And Pete said, uh, explained it, as well, tell the joke. And he said, yeah, but why is that funny? He said, it would take too long to explain <laughs> something. <laughs> but, you know, that's uh, it. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about the first tattoo Is The first is the tattoo myth um, from... Northwest Amazon. Okay. This is about just a page of this so long. Since there were no women, this is back in the, uh, if you like, in, in the uh, mythical past. Since there were no women, no women in those days, no women of an other group, uh, Moon took out the end of his penis to satisfy himself against the trunk of a banana tree. Moon is a man. He is the son of a son in the sky. He is uh, one of the night. She is his sister. She had finished peeling the manioc and went out to thro throw away the peels. Then she saw him. Ah, you're doing that all alone, you poor thing. I feel sorry for you. Come on and do it with me. But only one little time, so she said to her own brother. She let him do it and they made love together. She had told him, you can do it, but only once. But he didn't want to stop, and he came back to her um, that night. The next night, he went with her again. The same thing the next night. Every night, he went to play with her. She'd had enough of it. Who comes every night to play with me, she wondered. She was pregnant. Um, she prepared black dye, uh, guinepa. She poured it into a pot and uh, put it down near the fire next to her. That night, he showed up, while, and while they were doing it, she soaked her hands in the pot of guinepa dye and smeared the face of moon the one of the night. Look up there, you'll still see he has black spots. When he was finished, he went back to stretch out in his hammock. At daybreak, he looked into, in a mirror. Aye, there it was, his face was covered with black spots. In the pale night of dawn, he went to the forest, he went to a, a, a pegaroso tree, gashed it and covered his face with rubber sack to get rid of the stains. Nothing worked, 
They remained indelible. His sister was looking for him. Where can he be? It was surely he, my younger brother, who was coming every night to do it with me, she thought, because she didn't know in the darkness, she didn't know it was him. Um, she thought, she went off to look for him. She met him down there on the road in the forest. He was sitting with his eyes fixed on the mirror. She saw him come up behind him, she who was the cause of all the troubles. So she flipped his, the mirror and in a flash she was hurled up into the air, up into the sky. Moon was very angry and so he did this to get rid of her and make her disappear. This is sorcery. The words uh, for blowing to get rid of women go like this. Moon couldn't manage to pull out his blackened hairs. He thought um, uh, bad things. He was ashamed. Then he called uh, the um, uh, fire ants. They ate him completely. He died right there, there in the forest. Moon is the first one to get sick and die. He died like that by himself. Son, his father, was angry. Where is my son? What's happened to him? He said. And he went off to look for him. By this time, Moon had uh, no flesh left. He was rotten, decomposed. Only his bones remained, scattered on the ground. Sun went off to look for him, uh, to put him back together again, to remake his body. That's why people will blow to heal um, diseases. So that's the story of Moon. So this is um, the myth of why um, incense is, uh, incest sorry, is uh, problematic. Now, I want to um, uh, compare that or think about that in relation to another myth. And this is one by the Kuna. And the Kuna live, as I said, live on the uh, uh, Caribbean coast on little islands on, off the coast of Panama. They plant on the mainland and um, they live their houses on these little uh, desert islands just off the Panamanian coast. There are lots of them off the Panamanian coast if you ever look at a good map. Um, they're Swidden horticulturalists and um, mat uh, marriage is essentially um, matrilocal. It's matrilocal, and they practice largely village endogamy and bride service. And this is the, um, the so-called star girl story. So um, a married couple living in the village of Sokopti on the river of the same name in the Darien interior had four sons. Now remember that this is a society where, uh, like the mosquito, where um, sons get married out and it's daughters who get married in, yeah? This is, um, um, so, sorry, uh, sons, uh, son-in-laws become married in. So having four sons is you're going to, as my friend, one of my friends amongst the mosquitoes said, when you have sons, you lose the sweat, as he put it, because they go away. You lose the sweat, meaning their labor. Um, so um, as the boys grew up, their father bathed them in medicine, making them the sort of hardworking producers who bring home great quantities of game and plant crops in abundance. Because the four boys were such strong people, all the more mature men who had grown daughters wanted the boys as sons-in-law. But when prospective parents-in-law went to ask for them, the boys' parents always refused. Let me tell you something, I've raised my boys since they were small. I didn't raise them for someone else. I didn't bring them up for someone else to be eating well because of them. To keep the boys from wanting to marry, and of course matrilocally is the normal Kuna way, um, their parents gave them medicine to drink and bathe in which made them uninterested in women. After the medicinal treatments had continued for some years, however, the boys found even their own mother and sister repulsive. Uh, finally, they couldn't, drink, in ev they couldn't um, drink in their mother's presence anymore. They were leaving the cups untouched. The boys resolved to flee. One day they left work for work in the forest as usual, but failed to return in the evening, continuing instead for two days to the headwaters of the Sukukti River. Um, there they set to work again, and again they were tremendously productive, as many verses from the chanted version of the myth indicate in detailing all the crops they planted. Truly the boys were working in bananas, that's how the boys were. Truly the boys were working in Zanthoma, that's how the boys were. Truly the boys were working in yams, that's how the boys were. Truly the boys were working in white yams, they were working in purple yams. In addition to the crops they planted, the boys shot so much game that they had a separate smoking rack for each kind of animal, so much that the pelts they were taking off the animal were all going into the river and the river was getting blocked up. One day when they returned to the house, the place seemed different. They saw that things were already prepared for them. Food was cooked, banana drink was already prepared, the house was swept, things were ready, things were done. Moreover, it looked as if um, the half cut up meat had been taken. Um, of course, uh, the myths also recognised their mother's repugnant smell. They left immediately, travelling two days more to the headwaters of another river. The mother wept at losing her sons again. At their new home, the boys hunted and planted just as much as before, working in the forest throughout the day. Um, 
uh, one evening when they returned home by way of a path that led uh, from the river up to their house, they noticed that things were different. The boys saw that someone had planted flowers by the path to the water. The place smelled really fragrant. Fragrant. Then alongside the uh, house flowers, the, alongside the house, flowers were planted in rows. Pisep was planted, Kuke was planted, Nopar was planted. All three are sweet-smelling herbs and the place was all swept. Then when they were inside the house, they saw that cotton had been scattered under the hammocks. Cotton seeds had been scattered too. They saw that banana drink was waiting all prepared. They saw food sitting all cooked. Um, and remember, usually the boys had had to do their own cooking and housekeeping, but on that day, all of it had been done for them. The boys wondered who had been there, suspecting that it might have been their mother once again. The next day they resolved, all right then, brothers, let's catch the person who keeps coming here. One of the brothers was chosen to stay and hide himself behind a tree near the house. Towards noon, he heard something making a noise. The boys looked up and saw a golden platter coming from above. Um, the platter seemed to shine as it came. It was lighting everything up. The platter came close to the ground. A ladder dropped down and four beautiful girls descended. As the platter flew away again, the girls went into the house where they began to comb the seeds out of cotton and spin it, each of them in one of the boys' hammocks. They were making each other laugh. Ah, oh, this is my husband's hammock, one said. This is my husband's. The girls then swept, cooked, made banana drink, planted flowers, and then they went down to the river to bathe. Afterwards, they came back, ate, rested in the hammocks again, and finally, shortly before the boys were due back, the platter returned to carry them away. When the three brothers returned, they pestered the fourth to tell them what had happened, but he insisted that they eat first, and only afterwards um, uh, narrated the day's events. Skeptical of what he told them, they left another brother the next day who saw exactly the same thing as the first. When the other boys returned, he insisted in the same way that they eat first before hearing what happened. The brothers decided that on the next day they would all stay at home to catch the girls. They hid on the four sides of the clearing, arranging to signal the moment for rushing the girls by calls and whistles. The boys uh, watched the girls go through the whole day's routine until the girls were resting in their hammocks in late afternoon. Then one of the boys uh, whistled with his little fingers between his lips. Another made a hollow sound with his hands folded over his mouth. Another brother went to the other side and whistled. The boys charged the girls, each one grabbing a girl in the hammock. The girls, however, turned out to be extremely strong. And one by one, they out-wrestled the boys, fleeing to the platter, which had uh, returned. The youngest boy had held on to the girl the longest, called for help to his brothers. And as the platter flew off together, they subdued her. Then she told, she told them then, uh, uh, she then told them to let her go. I'm already stained with the smell of your skin, so where could I flee to get away from you? The brothers decided that the eldest among them should marry the girl who told them that her name was Ina Natili. She answered that she should marry the youngest who was not only caught, who had not only caught her, but was the husband for whom she was sent to earth, and the boys agreed to this arrangement. At first, the boys left uh, one of their number um, behind each day to a guard in Anatili, but she assured them that the platter would not return and reminded them that she had been caught by the smell of their skin. She went on to berate them, saying that they had not been impatient, uh, that if they had not been impatient and frightened the girls away, all of them would have been married because great father um, had sent them to earth to comfort the boys. She told them that she and her older sisters were star girls from the star village of the headwaters of the Olonkankawa Katawa in the Torkan, from the village, star village at the headwaters uh, in the world above. She added that she and her sisters often came down to earth when the moon was full to gather squash vines, squash flowers and parts of other food crops as medicines to make their hammock weaving go faster. Although only some of the myth texts say so explicitly, at some point during the following year, the boys returned to their uh, natal village with Inanatili. So Inanatili lived, she passed a year, and then in a fine paru bird was given to her. A fine taku kirku bird was given to her. In other words, a daughter was given to her. As the child grew, uh, Inanatila sang to her daughter while swinging in the hammock. And since the women of that era did not know how to sing lullabies, they learnt from her as she sang. Daughter, you've come to lie in my lap. I'm pleased to see you and I hope you grow up for me. Later on, you will do things along with me. You will keep an eye out uh, for your father and receive him when he comes. You will give your father something to drink. That's how you'll be. After a few years, the child fell sick. And though Inanatili went repeatedly to a medicinal curer to get medicines for her, eventually the little girl died. In the, those days, the women did not know how to mourn properly. All their mourning was uh, the partridge flew away, the chicha pot is broken, the palm leaf sways. Inanatili taught the women as she mourned for her daughter. Daughter, I thought you would grow up, but now great mother has taken you. I thought you would be doing things along with me. 
Inanna Tilly was weeping. I thought you would grow up. I thought you would wash your father's clothes, that you would do things. I thought that you would bring out a hand for me. I thought you would bring out a machete for me. And that, in other words, that's the words bring a, house, a husband into the household uh, uh, matrilocally. I thought you would bring out a farm for me. Thus Anna Tilly was weeping. But now you've gone and left me. You've gone to a good place. Um, uh, uh, up, uh, up there, your aunts will be waiting for you. You will stroll with your aunts amid golden uh, trees. In father's fine place, uh, the golden uh, tree place, the flower garden place, the flag garden place, amid all that you, that you will be playing, I believe. I don't know how long I will stay here, left behind you, and whether I will see you. In that way, in Anatili brought good weeping, it is said. So this, that's the myth, the so-called uh, star girl's descent. And um, the authors of this um, article, who are James Howe who, and uh, Lawrence Hirschfield, have argued that um, this myth is really uh, talking about the um, uh, Kuna notion of uh, the inappropriateness of any other kind of style of marriage other than matrilocal post-nuptial uh, residence and bride service and that any attempts to disrupt that as the parents of the four boys do will result in um, uh, uh, um, unpleasantness and um, things going badly wrong. So this is, we can come back to that in the discussion. So this is the, um, uh, um, the, uh, the Kuna girls um, myth. Just mindful, how much time have we got, Chris? Okay, um, in that case, I won't go on to the Rama Key myth. Um, I'll show you a nice picture uh, of the Ra of Rama Key, but I'll talk about the mosquito. Um, everything else there applies to them on the slide, except it's Rama. Um, but the, um, the, Sorry, what does Sweden mean? the Sweden is um, it's slash and burn farming. That um, you burn a part of the um, the forest or the growth, and then in the ashes, the ashes, the soil is particularly fertile, and then you plant there. Now, um, in some places, uh, people often think, oh, slash and burn farming, it's burning down the forest. But um, many people in Greater Am Amazonia, including the Rama and the Mosquito, that they do it on a cyclical basis so that um, they'll uh, burn the forest, plant cassava in there, and then they'll leave it, the soils to rest, and gradually that the forest will come back. As, uh, uh, and uh, typically they'll have a number of the Swidens, the actual plots of land where this kind of process happens, and they will be done on a, 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 on a cyclical basis. Uh, 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 basis. Okay, so I'll leave the Rama myth for now. Um, I'll just do um, the mosquito uh, story, which is quite short. This is one that I collected, um, and this is a story um, which really um, is about, I think, uh, the notion of uh, capture and imprisonment of um, and siege. Uh, 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 in a sense of uh, young girls. And w w the, the reason that I've um, put this in is that uh, mosquito, uh, although uh, mosquito women um, uh, 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 have this idea, or, sorry, mosquito have this idea of groom capture and uh, sons-in-law coming to live um, with uh, them, that it's often the case, the discourses often are that um, your um, adolescent girls, your adolescent daughters will bring men to come and work for you. So on the one hand, the mosquito young women are exhorted to demonstrate uh, shame and so forth and sexual continence uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, that they're also expected to use their sexual skills to uh, obtain um, sons-in-law that are suitable. Now the problem with that is the official discourse is that uh, sons-in-law who come to um, uh, uh, the girls uh, 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 will come to uh, the parents of the girls that they like and um, seek permission to court and all of those kind of things but uh, mosquito young women know that if they leave that then their conjugal futures are out of their hands and often uh, take matters into their own hands and this is really about uh, if you like um, a, a story which just says well that's what happens we may try and arrange our daughter's marriage but in the end they do what they want this is what I think the story is about and this is the story about um, the mosquito um, uh, trickster who's known as Jack and the Jack is uh, meaning is a kind of fish there's a kind of jackfish so this jackfish is the mosquito trickster so in this story Jack um, arrives at a town and obtains some menial work for the king Mosquito um, have a notion of a king because um, in the past the, uh, the British recognised the Mosquito King as one of the leaders and um, it's <laughs> the, the whole history of Mosquito um, politics in the region is about this kind of fictitious Mosquito monarchy but it's also become part of the Mosquito, if you like, uh, dis um, uh, story. 
So um, in this story, Jack arrives at a town and obtains some menial work for the king. The king has a beautiful daughter, but she is kept locked up in a high tower. The daughter um, sees Jack, likes him, and makes plenty sign, or sign secretly signals to him. She eventually lets down her hair from a high window. Now, where have we heard that before? And Jack uh, climbs up it. They have sexual intercourse and she becomes pregnant. The king, eventually aware of his daughter's pregnancy, asks her what happens and she tell what happened and she tells him. He then confronts Jack and demands an explanation. Jack is defiant, however, and he tells the king that he only took the job on in the first place because he wanted uh, his, the king's daughter. The king is annoyed but knows there's nothing he can really do now other than demands that Jack marry her. Jack agrees and within a day or so the king discovers that Jack has built a house of gold next to his, matrilocally according to usual mosquito practice and the king's delight. Everyone is now happy. So um, that's uh, another myth. I, I didn't have time for the, um, the Rama myth. What the Rama myth is about is about uh, uh, if you like tensions between um, brothers-in-law sort of thing. It's one about the difficulty of um, how difficult it is to domesticate um, brothers-in-law. So anyway, um, I'm going to wrap up um, now uh, and what I thought we might do in perhaps question time is have a little think about perhaps what these myths actually might mean and how we uh, to interpret them. So the significance of these myths, I've talked about Viveros de Castro's uh, multinaturalism and perspectivism to think about um, what these figures are like uh, how Jack Fish and um, uh, Moon and other kind of figures um, uh, actually, you know, can commit incest and things like that. Um, I've talked also about um, uh, affines as dangerous others um, to be domesticated, and uh, um, uh, um, I think we've seen that in some sense. And also, um, what I haven't talked about is that, as this is a trope that one finds all over um, uh, Greater Amazonia, is the notion of king, kin, and affines imagined as uh, reciprocally as predator and prey. And one finds this, for example, amongst um, the Wari, where um, uh, the souls of the dead, who have, remember, been eaten by um, their affines, turn into, um, um, become spouses for peccary spirits, and then peccary spirits come down to earth as real peccaries, and then uh, uh, um, uh, uh, are um, uh, 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 shot and killed and so forth. And this is something which is very common in um, hunting societies. Um, I think that this uh, notion of uh, kin and affines being imagined as uh, predator and prey, certainly I I in the Americas. Um, the other thing I would think of, uh, just perhaps this just as a, a, a afterthought, is that um, uh, levi strossian structuralism emerged, uh, I think, uh, through Levi-Strauss, I think to a considerable extent, through Levi-Strauss reading uh, the uh, literature uh, from Greater Amazonia. And I think that this idea, the whole thing about um, his ideas about the incest taboo, which I think in some sense, you know, obviously come from Tyler, but on the same sense that um, also rep represents that he recognised that this was something which was... Um, an important kind of trope within Greater Amazonia. So whether if Levi-Strauss had gone to another part of the world, whether he would have invented um, structuralism in the way that he did is, some, is perhaps something that, you know, we might think about as well. OK, um, I'll stop there and thank you for attention. And um, uh, I'd be very interested if it's to hear your thoughts on those uh, myths.